Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry for the slight delay. We're trying to see how many more people would uh, trickle in. We had a really good sign up uh, list for this event. Uh, in fact, I would encourage those of you who are sitting on the edges, unless you have to leave at some point to try and move in, because we fully expect uh, people to trickle in even as the event uh, progresses. But thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. My name is Monde Muyangwa, and I am the director of the Africa program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And on behalf of the program, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, afternoon discussion on the critical issues of the unique challenges posed by armed non-state actor groups, including terrorist groups in Africa. <coughs> Our dialogue today is really intended to be forward-leaning, uh, to look at the landscape of um, the non-state actor, armed non-state actor groups in Africa, how they are evolving, their impact on the communities in which they operate, and to really take a look at the responses that we have had uh, to those non-state uh, groups at both the local, the national, the regional, and the international levels. And we have challenged our speakers to come up with some concrete recommendations in terms of how we could do a better job of uh, addressing uh, this challenge. I want to take this moment to introduce our partner for this event, Dr. Cyril Obi and the African Peacebuilding Network, which is partnering with us on, on this event. Uh, the African Peacebuilding Network is an important program of the Social Sciences Research Council, and it works to support independent African research on conflict-affected countries and the integration of such research into regional and global policy communities. The APN is a close ally of the Wilson Center's Africa Program Southern Voices Network, and we're glad to join forces in confronting complex issues such as the spread and impact of armed non-state actors throughout the African continent. And the, our partnership is really important because what we thought we would do for this event is to bring both African perspectives and U.S. perspectives and really have a discussion about this challenge and figure out what the issues, the areas of confluence are, and perhaps where the areas of difference and um, exist and what we can do to better bridge uh, those differences and therefore our responses in terms of how we tackle uh, this challenge. As many of you know, which is why you're here, there are numerous armed non-state actors groups across Africa, some legal, others illegal. Our session here today will focus on the latter. And so from Boko Haram in Nigeria, all of us remember the kidnapping of the Nigerian girls and the thousands of uh, people in West Africa who have lost uh, their lives to Boko Haram activities to militants in the Niger Delta, Al-Shabaab in the Horn of Africa. We all remember the horrific attacks on Kenya's Garissa uh, University, to Akim in North Africa, suicide bombings, but also <coughs> rebel groups across um, Central Africa, uh, the Seleka rebels in Central Africa, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, just to name a few of the groups. And so understanding how these groups come about, how they're evolving and mapping out their future trajectories locally and internationally, and looking how we can develop more effective and sustainable res responses is of critical uh, importance. And so we've assembled a really good group of uh, speakers to help us explore uh, these questions. And before I turn uh, the panel over to Dr. Obi, who will moderate the first panel and I will moderate the, um, the second uh, panel, let me talk a little bit about how we've organized uh, the two sessions. The first session, uh, moderated by Dr. Obi, will focus on North Africa, West Africa, and the Sahel, while the second session that I will moderate will dive into the issues on um, the Niger Delta and the Horn of Africa, as well as the policy responses to countering violent extremism in Africa. While we have taken a regional approach, we will try throughout uh, the two sessions <coughs> to simultaneously work on identifying and deconstructing the overlapping challenges and issues. So the first panel will run from uh, until 2.30, and then will be followed by a brief 15-minute coffee break, uh, during which we'll set up for panel two, which will run from 2.45 to 4 p.m., and then we'll have a reception uh, in the atrium where we hope to continue the dialogue amongst ourselves, but also uh, with uh, each of our speakers. We have asked our speakers to each offer prepared remarks for no more than 10 minutes so we can allow for much discussion. Uh, this is as much the speakers benefiting from your input as it is our benefiting from the speaker's expertise. And um, so after the 10 minute, after both speakers have spoken, Dr. Obi will moderate a Q&A. We'll ask everybody to please keep your questions and comments to under a minute. 
Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of people here and we want to benefit from everybody's expertise. Uh, so please uh, be very direct and pointed and, and to the point in your contributions. With that, let me introduce Dr. Obi so he can uh, begin his moderation. He is currently the program director at the Social Science Research Council where he leads the Africa Peace Building Network program, bringing his extensive research, networking, and publishing experience on African peace, security, and development to the council. From 2005 to 2011, he was a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden. He has also worked with the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, where he, was an, he is an associate research professor. He is also a research associate of the Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and a visiting scholar at the Institute of African Studies at Columbia University in New York. He is widely published and serves on several editorial uh, boards. Dr. Obi, the floor is yours, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Maud, for the introduction and the generous uh, words. Um, as Maud has mentioned, uh, our overall objective today is to explore the present and future tra trajectories of terrorist and non-state actors in Africa. So the operative word will be terrorists and then non-state actors. Uh, the first panel, which is a panel I'm going to moderate, is going to look at North Africa and West Africa to help explore those questions. And some of the questions are so important. Uh, a lot of material is available on who these actors are. Sometimes a lot of emphasis is on the terrorist dimension, but it's also important not to forget non-state actors that operate both within state boundaries as well as what I call the transnational spaces or transregional spaces that exist between states. And I'm not just talking of geographical proximity. There is a space out there that is transnational that is also virtual. And some of these non-state actors are beginning to master the technology and are able to use some of these existing spaces and opportunities to do what they do. To help us explore those questions about what lessons have we learned, what has changed, and what is likely to change and how do we begin to anticipate and respond to the likely trajectories that terrorists and non-state actors would likely adopt. At a time where Africa, paradoxically, is enjoying unprecedented economic growth, and yet we find out that we have problems of security, we have problems of a rapidly growing youth population. There are issues of inequality, poverty, unemployment, in the midst of this economic boom. This raises a lot of questions. And to help us explore those questions, I have two people who will look at the long-term, the medium-term, and the short-term impacts of this development and the activities of these groups and the likely activities of these groups, both at the community level, at the national level, and at the regional levels and to begin to critically examine the responses that we have had and how they are responding to our own responses. I have to my immediate left, Ms. Idayat Hassan, and to my extreme left, Dr. Benjamin Nichols. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 minutes, as you've already heard, and we'll turn to the audience. Uh, we'll break for 15 minutes and there will be refreshments at the atrium. Now let me introduce Dr. Uh, Miss Idayat Hassan. I'm always used to saying doctor. Uh, maybe I'm speaking in terms of your future trajectory. <laughs> However, Miss Idayat Hassan is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, West Africa. It is based in Nigeria, but has affiliates and has partnerships with civil society organizations across West Africa as well as a relationship with the economic community of West African states. It's based in Abuja, Nigeria's capital, and it's a policy advocacy and research organization, which focuses on deepening democracy and development, but has done some work and has convened meetings on the activities of Boko Haram, as well as other non-state actors 
in, in Nigeria and other West African countries. Uh, she's a lawyer by profession, and she's held fellowships in several universities across Europe and North America. At present, she's a Yale World Fellow at uh, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Her core interests and expertise span democracy, peace and security, and transitional justice in West Africa. Today, we've asked Ms. Hassan to draw on her experience on these issues to speak about, about peace and security in West Africa. Um, last but not least, I have Dr. Benjamin Nichols. He is an associate professor and academic chair for transnational threats and counterterrorism at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies based here in Washington, DC. In his capacity, Dr. Nichols works with African governments, regional organizations, and civil society leaders to address African security challenges and to develop solutions that promote human rights, democratic values, and civil military relations. He has worked with security professionals on the ground in 20 African countries and several European nations. Dr. Nichols' research focuses on terrorism and counterterrorism, political violence and human security in the Sahel, North Africa, and the Horn, as well as security cooperation in Africa, including the role of US, Euro European, and other international players. Today, we've asked Dr. Nichols to speak on the emergence of terrorism in North and West Africa and the Sahel and potential counterterrorism responses. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. <laughs> Ms. Hassan, at this point, I will turn it over to you. You have 10 minutes. Can I stand? I think I'd like to stand. <laughs> And I'll start with a confession. They asked me to give an overview, not all this. But be that as it may, it's actually a very interesting thing to be here today at a critical point in time in the history of Africa. For quite a long time, we've been experiencing a new form of unrest. For quite a long, if you look at our trajectory, when you talk about unrest or tragedy, it's either natural disaster or man-made in terms of coup d'etat, political unrest, civil and um, civil wars. But in the last years, emphasis has been on something entirely new, which is terrorism. And this terrorism spans a lot of actors. Some might say, yeah, Islamic jihadist group and other non-state actors in particular, masquerading as ethnic militia groups across Africa, self-determination group, you can call them, and now more and more in form of even private securities you know, in itself. But for the moment, our emphasis and what we actually see the most is that of terrorism. And this cuts across all parts of the continent. You can talk in terms of the Al-Shabaab of, um, of Somalia, based in Somalia, but operating in Kenya, Djibouti, and lots of places. Boko Haram, based in Nigeria, operating as are today in Cameroon, Chad, and Niger. The Sanai group also, I like to shorten it and call them ABM, which who are actually formidable threats in Egypt. The Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or Al-Qaeda, call it in each part of the continent, there are different groups terrorizing people, simply put. But what do they have in common also? It is the way they operate in terms of killing people, brutal killing, beheading, things that are actually on head of. Previously in Nigeria, they say there will be never, there can never be any Nigeria that can be involved in suicide bombing because Nigerians love life too much. Now, on a daily basis, you see suicide bombing, even three, four, five, and across the continent as a form of asymmetric um, uh, warfare, really. Beyond that, kidnapping is, uh, is the same for them. Uh, beheading target, targeting of Christians, and even slavery is now reintroduced by all these groups. And most of them have got a regional objective because they are no longer located in the country. More and more, they seem to be operating in several countries 
for this group. Um, and the brutality, of course, is there for everybody to actually see. But the trend and the threat that we face the most today is that of the Islamic State, really. It might, for some, seem far-fetched. Because the immediate thing you can think is, yes, is it because Boko Haram, for instance, has pledged allegiance or uh, buyer to the Islamic State? Yes, it might be partly the reason, because it gives them a foothold in West Africa and, of course, in the Sahel. What about the Sinai group? There is Islamic State in Libya. This has got advantages. And you might even say they might never make a, a, a head in, in Africa. But don't also forget that the way people are beginning to join more and more the Islamic State is actually very, very fearful. In, in recently, Sudan came up with 70 of its students joining. In Ghana, where we don't even talk of terrorism, really, there are two confirmed cases. In Nigeria, one of the most respected and reputable elder statesmen had his family, with, had his son, with two wives and children, join the Islamic State. And this is little, but very, very important, considering that you have a a continent that is very, very poor in data gathering, porous borders, and of course, uh, even information, the secrecy of information is a factor, and a very strong youth bulge. Who knows how many is actually departing, and the impact they will have when we come back. Libya is a very example for us to see, and the impact of Libya in West Africa and the Sahel today cannot but be overstated at every point in time. But coming to the issue of terrorism, really, which is one of the challenges in terms of countering even the violent extremism in itself, in Africa today, a layman's definition of terrorism is just some people coming together, Islamic group, coming and brutally killing everybody. That is the first thing that comes to mind, not the academic presentation of this. Islam, kill just like that. And that seems to also be the stance of the state. While some might argue and say, yes, insurgency, yes, they have political agenda, they have the ability to probably control territory or plan to actually acquire or, or control territory. And of course, um, they, um, they are questioning the legitimacy of the government. But when it comes to terrorism, the basic is the basic. And because of some of these factors and the gruesome mother, the attitude of the government is also to actually adopt the terrorism model in terms of nipping in board the crisis. This is good on the fact that when you look at the, f the fact that it creates revulsion in the minds of people and might not allow more people to join. Then from the legal point of view, you say it is a criminal offense. You cannot assist them in terms of capacity, either financial or technical capacity. But when it comes to policy making, it gives only one dimension, which is to win the war, the battle, not the war against terror in itself. And if I use the example of Boko Haram in Nigeria, that was the immediate approach, even from the onset of the crisis where they made um, the move from Dawa to Jihad. How many more minutes? Four. Four. Uh, when they moved, uh, made the move from Dawa to Jihad, the president said, nip it in the bud. And that has been the emphasis since then, that it is always a matter of the enemy-centric approach, never giving room to a holistic approach in terms of looking at what are the core challenges? What has happened? How do we redress it? And who are these populations that are right there in the middle of the whole crisis, fighting and suffering? So you bring in the population that is actually suffering, that are both economic, political, socially, and you actually get most of them recruited into this. So when you look at the trajectory of Boko Haram in Nigeria between 2011 and 2012, many people actually joined because of the approach of the government. Before the last election, the question was always for Northeastern Nigeria, for instance, to say, yes, uh, is there a government, are we Nigerians? 
and if we are Nigerians, do the government of Nigeria actually believe that we are Nigerian? Since emphasis is also on winning this war. And it's this same enemy centric approach that we have also observed most of the foreign nations approaching in terms of ending the insurgency. So when they come in, the thing is let us train the military forces uh, or the law enforcement agency. Let's help in terms of regional cooperation. Let us also help them in terms of border control. There may be access to justice on how to actually deal with uh, the people that are tried, that have been tried for being part of this terrorist group. This approach does not also take in cognizance of the population. Of recent, there have been CVEs, but does it really trickle down to the grassroots? And how well does it actually uh, fit in? Even at the AU level, the approach is on the multinational joint tax force. For instance, in, in the in the late Chad Basin, as, it's, as it applies to Nigeria and its allies, for instance. This, we must never forget that while this group may belong to international terrorist group or might have sworn allegiance or have got affiliation to them, the issue is that of poor governance. And terrorism within our context remains local, linked to the bad governance that has occasioned poverty and inequality, such that any approach that must be adopted must be holistic and take into cognizance these historical challenges. And by historical also, it should not be reduced to the last 10 years to really understand Islam, in particular, in West Africa, it is enough that you go up to the 12th century to really see that there is an existing trajectory and nothing has really fundamentally changed. So what are the key solutions? First and foremost, you have to talk in terms of good governance. And this good governance should actually redress the bad governance with emphasis on human development. It is, not in it is not enough to always talk about the economy, as in what is the economic implication and how do you deal with the existing poverty. But you really have to talk about how to deal with the economic, the social, and the political in itself. Then secondly is also the issue of the historical, which I've actually mentioned in terms of research and policy making and population-centric approach. And there is something that I've really been thinking in terms of, it is also the issue of accountability and maybe transitional <coughs> justice. Most of this emphasis does not take into cognizance for people, for example, people in Mali, whose hands were actually cut off by the Abdul Hakim enforcer during the time and Sardin and those other militant group were actually in operation in this country. What happens to all the people that have also been badly treated by the Boko Haram insurgents in Nigeria? Now there is a safe corridor for the Boko Haram that is being envisaged. There is going to be rehabilitation of Northeast Nigeria. But how do you deal with the victims of this insurgency? Thank you. Ah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Idayat. Um, her presentation has raised issues. Uh, her argument basically is that the increased activities of, of terrorist groups and, and as well as non-state actors cannot be separated from the issue of bad governance. Uh, it, indirectly, it also talks about the nature of the state and the ability of the state to play its role in those societies. So even in talking about non-state actors, we are also not going to shy away from, from state actors. Um, another interesting point she raises about the local, is the local roots of these terrorist organizations. Even though they may claim allegiance to global movements, uh, their grievances and their recruitment grounds and their histories are rooted in, in local realities including the history of Islam in West Africa. She points to the question of inequality. But I, I have some questions about 
now that these issues have been raised, how, how do you really bring about the kind of governance that would, as it were, drain uh, the social roots of this content and the, the tendency towards extremism? Um, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen 10, 20, 30 years ago? Uh, these are very interesting questions, and I hope that you have your questions prepared. And during the Q&A, we shall delve deeper into this. With that formal ado, I'm going to call on um, Dr. Benjamin Nichols. Uh, you please uh, go ahead and make your presentation. You have 10 minutes. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come and share a couple um, of my thoughts this afternoon. Uh, my remarks are really based on my um, own research and my experience uh, in exchanges with European, U.S., and particularly African uh, policymakers across the last few years. And I just say that my words here today are my own and they don't represent uh, any institution or government. Uh, so I'd like to offer some thoughts about what I would call violent non-state actors in an area that we might call Northwest Africa. And in particular, I'd like to try and interpret the threat that those actors pose, explain some of the shortcomings in responses to them, then offer a couple policy recommendations. So let me begin with some interpretations of the threat. And I've tried to kind of give some highlight uh, bullet points that you might be able to, to, to keep and then uh, we can work from there. So my first point here would be that, you know, simply that violent non-state actors are an integral part of Northwest Africa. Armed actors are a widespread and long-standing feature of the security landscape and they take many forms. Um, we've seen separatist movements, we've seen traffickers, organized traffickers, self-defense groups, vigilante groups, and so on. And I think in broad terms, violent non-state actors are prevalent and powerful because of troubles uh, with the nation-state model, really, in Northwest Africa. So as states, these countries have not always been able to establish a monopoly on the legitimate use of force in their territory to project power into rural or certain urban settings, or to provide governance to all of their citizens. And as nations, the countries have struggled at times to generate enough political unity and economic integration across lines of region, ethnicity, religion, and race to relegate armed groups to the utter fringes of society. And frankly, faced with this reality, Governments in Northwest Africa have taken different approaches at different times to some of these actors. There's certainly been opposition, but there's also been some tolerance and sometimes sanction and, and collaboration with certain uh, armed non-state actors. So that's the first point. The second point is that I do think something new is happening, particularly with Islamist terrorist groups in Northwest Africa. So violent non-state actors that claim some inspiration from Islam which have actually been around for decades, have had a growing impact uh, on the region in recent years. I think there's a convergence of several trends uh, that helps to explain the new force and staying power of these groups. I think there's a conjuncture of factors at different levels. There are some national factors. So I think you know, a backlash effect uh, from Nigeria's approach in 2009 to Boko Haram would be an example. Uh, regional factors, the Arab Spring and its reverberations and international factors like the advent of the Islamic State and its effect on what we might call you know, the global movement of, of jihad. Uh, I think those different kinds of developments in the past four or five years is, have, have uh, created a new type of challenge. And I think we've seen that in different ways. We've seen unprecedented levels of violence. Um, attacks have grown exponentially. So I looked at some recent data and in each year since 2011, the number of attacks in Northwest Africa has at least doubled over every previous year's count. So it's growing exponentially. And terrorist attacks are also claiming many lives. So as you may know, the Council on Foreign Relations keeps a Nigeria security tracker, and that has counted some 25,000 deaths from the Boko Haram conflict since May of 2011. Um, and we've seen these groups also seize uh, opportunities to claim and control territory. We've seen that in Mali, in Nigeria, in Libya. And uh, we've also seen these groups spread their attacks across borders. We've seen attacks kind of move across uh, the Sahel, and we've seen attacks in the Lake Chad Basin region. So there is something relatively new that's happening. And then my last interpretive point would be that 
my sense is that terrorism in Northwest Af Africa is going to get worse before it gets better. I think that by now these groups are anchored enough in their contexts that they will take a good amount of time to uproot. I think these groups are interconnected enough to find refuge in regional and global associations in times of duress. And they've proliferated in number. So we no longer uh, just see a couple uh, main groups like Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb or Boko Haram, but there are a number of other new groups um, that are appearing, Junda Khilafah, uh, Ansar Bekt al-Maqdis, Mujao, uh, uh, Ansar, uh, Ansar al-Din, et cetera. So many groups uh, now as opposed to just a couple. And you know, since these threats have survived for um, a couple years, they're likely to persist for many more. Terrorist groups that make it through the first year of existence tend to persist. So that's kind of how I see the development of the security landscape and the threat. In terms of responses, why have regional and national actors struggled to rein in violent non-state actors, especially these specific terrorist groups that I've been mentioning? I think in response to that, a couple of things can be said. You know, first, I think that some of the regional bodies that are expected to take a lead in the response are not really primarily built to handle collective security, especially the particular challenge of terrorism. There's been a tendency uh, to turn to the regional economic communities, the RECs, ECOWAS, ECAS, for this work, but really their purpose, as their name suggests, really started as um, economically oriented. And uh, you know, the, the problems that we're facing with these terrorist uh, groups cross the regional economic communities' uh, boundaries, just like they cross national boundaries. So Boko Haram is both in the west and the central area of Africa. Challenges in northern Mali are both in North Africa as well as West Africa. Moreover, you know, the, the work of doing security cooperation is, is slow work. Um, you know, developing regional level interoperability, information sharing, intelligence sharing, coordinated civilian responses, it takes time. It takes time to build the processes, to have the experience, to build the trust. And finally, as some uh, African uh, colleagues of mine, I guess, would um, mention or often mention when they're working at the regional level is that you know, regional bodies are only as strong as their member states. And so that brings me to a, a second point. I think that many Northwest African nations underestimated and didn't um, prepare all that well for the new challenge. I think in some ways this was perhaps inevitable because they have some challenges as uh, nations and states, which I mentioned. But I also think there was an unawareness of a growing extremism in their societies. Um, in, in non-state uh, institutions and organizations on the ground. There's also something of a generational gap. I think that, you know, Northwest uh, African societies have seen uneven experiences in new information and communication technologies, for example, and states haven't always uh, understood how to uh, comprehend and react to, you know, uh, extremist messaging online, for example. And then finally, a last point on this response question. You know, why, have it, why has it been so difficult? I mean, I would just say that overcoming terrorist challenges is really hard. I think that we shouldn't sell short the efforts that have been made by African bodies and nations and societies. The African Union, ECOWAS have been involved in Mali. They've uh, made protocols and treaties and, and strategies for counterterrorism. And countries have made serious efforts and sacrifices um, in the fight against terrorism. Algeria, Morocco, Chad, um, Niger, Mauritania have taken up that role. And there is something of an inherent challenge in running an effective asymmetric campaign and defeating terrorism. And I think that's something that Europeans and the U.S., frankly, uh, should be able to understand quite well, even when you have resources and have a variety of tools available. Um, overcoming terrorism internationally and domestically is a challenge. So uh, a couple of recommendations to conclude my uh, opening thoughts. I'll offer three. First, um, I think that policymakers uh, would do well to partner more effectively. Containing and countering violent non-state actors, especially the ones that I've been talking about, requires links across agencies, societies, nations, and multilateral actors. And I think that partnerships would be stronger if they were based um, on, as much as possible, direct and frank discussions about differing objectives and roles and the inevitable trade-offs and tough choices that come along uh, with making policy. And I think that uh, particularly Northwest African <coughs> nations and their external partners would do well to discuss security cooperation plans early and often. 
I think a constant contact would improve um, the joint efforts. Second point, uh, blocking the spread of terrorism in Northwest Africa. And this was mentioned a bit by my colleagues here. Um, I think it's clear at this point that there are some serious terrorist challenges in Libya, uh, Mali, Nigeria, and that they have implications uh, for contiguous areas in Tunisia, in Niger, Cameroon, and so on. And these must be addressed. There have also been some signs of new attacks and recruitment in other countries. Um, in Ghana, which was mentioned, uh, perhaps Senegal, um, even perhaps Burkina Faso, which is going through a particularly important moment of its history right now. So I think policymakers um, should work on, on crafting subtle policies that help stop the spread without unproductively securitizing the question or populations. And this is a time sensitive um, recommendation. There's kind of a window of opportunity if, uh, if we're right in seeing a spread here, and I think that window could close. Then a third and last recommendation. Um, I think policymakers should plan for the aftermath. I think at present there is a good amount of energy and thought going into counterterrorism in North and West Africa. I think some effort, a uh, growing amount of effort, is going into thinking about countering violent extremism, kind of addressing the larger context of glorifying and supporting terrorism. But I don't know that so much thought is being put into um, planning for the aftermath of today's terrorist threats in North and West Africa. I think it would, you know, we would all do well to give some attention to thinking through the inescapable questions that will come the day after. The day after Boko Haram is gone or at least subdued, for example. You know, how will foot soldiers in organizations like this be handled? Will there be a DDR program for them? What about demands for justice and state accountability within communities affected by conflicts? Um, what plans are in place for the literally millions of displaced populations and, and uh, refugees that have been affected by the conflicts? Is there going to be de-radicalization programs for certain members of, of the violent non-state actors that I've been talking about? So to my mind, planning for the aftermath is actually part and parcel of taking seriously our own expectations that our counterterrorism counter efforts will eventually succeed and that we are in fact planning for success. So those are a handful of policy recommendations that I would like to share uh, in conclusion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, we have heard from both speakers. They have both spoken about what you would consider to be the current situation. Uh, linked to the crisis of the nation state project or to the crisis of governance. Uh, in my remarks, I spoke about, yes, it's about non-state, but you can't leave out the state. Um, what do you do about the state? Uh, if you want to talk about recommendations, the state will be a key player. What do you do about the state in terms of the recommendations that have been made? Itayat talks about having a holistic approach that doesn't just rely on exclusively military responses. Uh, Benjamin also sp speaks about thinking in terms of partnerships, frank discussions, and what to do after, the after, uh, after these groups are gone. Um, the aftermath, the day after, what happens? What will the state do? What can states in Africa do? What can regional organizations do? And what of the other kind of non-state actor that is legal, that is working to promote democracy, that is working to promote security? Where are they? What can they do? I, I think these are some of the questions that come out. In terms of the new methods of these groups and the fact that they are new, uh, this is something that we have to deal with. I'm a bit concerned that while Idaya talks about the spread of ISIS, we hear that things will have to become worse from Benjamin before they get better, which means that we have a fair idea of what the trajectory is likely to be. Are we prepared? <coughs> what should we do? I now turn it over to the audience to start asking questions. We will collect the questions in maybe four or five questions at a go, and we'll come back to this side to get our two experts to respond and we see how far we can go before the 15 minute break. Thank you very much. So, who wants to go first? Yes. I see a hand there. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the questions in fives. So, and I'm going to progress from the front to the back, if you don't mind, so that we'll move in waves. Uh, I think that will, so I have somebody here. Uh, there's a lady in the, in the red jacket. And on the row after that, oh, there's a gentleman before her. So I'm on the third row now. And there are two, the, the guy with the cap and the guy in front of him. That's the first five. Thank you. So please, you have the floor. One quick question. I don't understand the distinction that's being made, I assume, between terrorist groups and armed non-state actors. It's not clear to me, and people seem to use them interchangeably. Another quick question is, what's the difference today in the transnationalism of these groups versus earlier wars where there clearly was a regional or transnational component. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you Can very you much. please introduce yourself? Yes. I'm Brice Bado, uh, Africa Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, most of his uh, group are using modern weaponry. So the weapons, how do how is it possible that this group can uh, acquire weapons without uh, uh, any control from the state? I think that we can control at least this. We can limit it, uh, their access to weapons. So this is my question, what is made to do that? And my second question, uh, for me, I think that uh, terrorism of these groups, I can define them as a, a kind of uh, militarization of discontentment or uh, uh, frustration. I think that if we define it from this social perspective, maybe we will uh, be able to use, uh, 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 not to limit it, the responses to the uh, military, but to other uh, factors, social political factors. Thank you very much. Thank you. The lady behind you. Hi, my name is Demilola Kinyeli. I'm a Nigerian graduate student here at American University. And my question is a two-part question. And it's, um, do you think the neglect of nothing Nigeria's developments and institutions contribute to the growing strength of Boko Haram? So not the history of Boko Haram, but the growing strength of Boko Haram. And also, do you think the focus should be on establishing institutions and policies that foster equity and inclusivity, for example, education, but also keeping in mind the fact that in this region, we make a lot of policies, but sometimes they're not implemented. Thank you. The gentleman in the cup and then the man in front of him. Thank you. My name is Ake Kola Wole. I'm a legal practitioner in Nigeria. Uh, Ms. Asan, you spoke of partnership, which is very crucial in West Africa. That could be done within agencies and in fact, head of states. But are you, what can you say about the weak institutional capacities of law enforcement agencies. Thank you very much. And uh, last in this round, the gentleman. Yeah, my name is Safili from Sierra Leone, West Africa. I'm a member of IDEA, Washington, DC. My question is for the lady there. African problems, democracy, African president. What is your own role occupying that desk we have 54 African head of state, 1.3 billion Africans. But the president, they don't want to go. I take my country, Sierra Leone. The 1991 war came about simply because bad governance, poor infrastructure, extension of life, just like we take like Bujumbura, Paul Ngurizisa. <laughs> Man, they said, you have two terms. You said you, you are going to have 88 terms. The local population go aggrieved. And that no matter what sort of infrastructure, if there's African leaders who don't want to go, they don't want to go. 
And if you don't want to go, you are creating chaos in your country. No matter what the international committee does, chaos. You have two terms. You said you are going to have 88 terms. Why? Thank so my you, question man. is for you, what is your role? Thank you. Talk to those 54 Africa and say that it's time to go after two times. Go! Thank you very much. Thank you. Now you have the floor. Zayat, a lot of the questions were posed to you. Can you please respond and then Benjamin will follow. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'll start with uh, what do we have to do really. I think the issue of tenure elongation is actually the biggest crisis we are facing on Africa. All of a sudden the future of democracy is just seem is, is really, really shaky because of these leaders that are not ready to leave office. But it's not what is my role, but what is the role of Africans, really? From DRC Congo to, um, we are seeing what is evolving in Congo at the moment. We have a preemption of what will happen in Rwanda. Of course, uh, Burundi is there at the moment. Every day people are dying and nothing is actually being done. But we also saw what happened in Burkina Faso just this past few weeks. So the real future is we as the people and what we can actually have. In Burkina Faso, the people did not just uh, send out Blaise Kampove. When there was a military coup d'etat, they actually made sure that their will reflected. Not even what ECOWAS was negotiating. Everything ECOWAS negotiated for the, the, was actually thwarted, not by anything, but by the will of the people. Today, the coup leader is in prison or whatever, is going to be facing the law. Normally, what was negotiated was that he should have some form of amnesty by the leaders, but the people's will eventually prevailed. How do we governize action? How do we governize the citizens of our continent to actually make a difference. Then on the issue of partnership, really, partnership is very, very important, but I think that at the moment we are working very, very much on partnership, particularly from the West African level. So you see every day men in JTF is up there. When, I, when President Buhari actually resumed office, the first thing he did was to visit Cameroon, visit um, all our neighbors from Niger to Chad to Benin to Cameroon, trying to come up with a cohesive strategy in terms of fighting Boko Haram. And of course, the international actors are helping us foster that as well. So we are doing very good on that level, even if there is challenges on the part of ECOWAS, really, because even ECOWAS has got its own counterterrorism strategy, which at the moment is not even being implemented. It's just like another document on the, on the shelves that nobody even knows about, or any of the state parties are actually following this document. But the issue of weak capacity of law enforcement agency, it's a reality and is one of the biggest challenge in most of this uprising. Because it's not only that they are using extrajudicial factors, but also in terms of um, uh, intelligence gathering remains a challenge. And also how they even corruption that is rife there that they let go some of these terrorists without them facing uh, the rot of the of the law in itself. And somebody was asking the issue of proliferation of arm, which is actually very, very connected. That how do this every weaponry, how does it actually get into the state? Is part of weak law enforcement agency, particularly corruption on their part where they turn the other way. Um, again, the issue of our porous borders is a very, very big challenge. So you have a very porous border where it's so easy to come into Cameroon or uh, from Cameroon to Nigeria on foot and bring as much as, uh, as much weaponry as you want. All roads have already been created while the law enforcement agency are looking the other way. And of course, one of the biggest issues is also that of proliferation of arms in the, in the region. And this proliferation of arms is not just on the part of the, of the militant group, all these terrorist institutions. It has also led to a proliferation even by the ordinary people. For instance, at the beginning of the insurgency in northern Nigeria, people stood back and they were like, yes, 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 it can just go on the way it is. It is. We will do nothing. We will wait on the government. But at the point, the horse stood up and people were getting weapons. All forms of weapons, you can talk in terms of the blacksmiths. While the economy was actually suffering in northern Nigeria, the blacksmiths were the ones making lots of money. 
because they could get all people were harming themselves with ding guns, different kinds of weaponry. So it's one of it's going to be one of the biggest challenge that we will have to deal with post conflict and the connivance of non states uh, of state actors really in some of this weaponry. There are unconfirmed reports that even at the height of the insurgency at the beginning of the year that some part of the Nigerian government were actually, because of the contractors, the security contractors were fueling the insurgency by giving some of this weaponry to people. Even the issue of cowardice comes in. So a general was just, um, was just sentenced to prison last week in Nigeria. Some people abandoned their weaponry. So uh, the Boko Haram was getting the most of his weaponry from Nigerian uh, army because they were abandoning it in fear of this insurgent group, apart from the fact that they also had very, very sophisticated weapon. On the issue of Northern Nigeria, it's just a fact that the neglect itself was one of the reasons for the insurgency. When you look at Mohammed Yusuf, at the beginning, of the set. The only thing he did to gain currency was preaching against the ills of Nigerian state. So every minute when he gathers his people together in those days, some allege that he even had up to 500,000 followers. He only preached against the Nigerian state. So he talks about unemployment, he talks about uh, um, corruption in the society, he talks about the failure of everything that, should, that a state could actually should actually provide. And for everything he said to these people, they could see the evidence right there in their society. So it was easy for him. And he was also able to use the political factor when he started acting as a state within the Nigerian state. So all the social services that the state should provide, he started providing it in terms of health, in terms of, uh, of social welfare scheme, just like the micro finance uh, system. So I think I'll turn the question of the transnationalism to my colleague. Benjamin. Yeah, sure. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your response. Thanks. Yeah, to pick up a couple um, points. I mean, as far as definitions go between armed non-state actors, violent non-state actors, um, and terrorists, I think um, one of the points I was trying to make initially is that there clearly are groups that um, are armed and are not state actors and, and have a uh, role playing either you know, like a protection or security and sometimes a governance role in different places um, in North and West uh, Africa and that the states have actually had to, to handle or to, to approach that. So I mentioned different groups like you know, um, traffickers or different separatist movements and so on. Um, vigilante groups as well, or uh, even as my colleague was just mentioning, different groups of people who have decided to arm themselves for self-protection or self-defense groups. You know, which among those gets dubbed a terrorist or a terrorist organization um, is obviously one point of debate. We all know about the um, debates about definitions of terrorism, but I do think it's important to bring that up in the context of the um, question of partnership, which I had mentioned. You know, the frank and the um, direct an ongoing conversation among uh, different partners, one thing that needs to be talked about is which groups we're identifying as terrorists for counterterrorism activity. Not everybody has the same list. And so that's an important point. And it ju I think it just should be um, more frankly uh, discussed. I think that would improve uh, partnerships and policy. In terms of differences between, or, or what is different between transnational threats today and maybe um, the conflicts in the past, uh, to my mind is, is that the violent non-state actors that are, I would consider transnational are in some ways less connected to um, states these days. And what I mean by that is that I think that less of the conflict that we're seeing is interstate. And if you look at the continent as a whole, there are, in the past, we've seen examples of proxy wars where small groups have been used by other states. I think the kinds of problems that we're seeing now, we're seeing violent non-state actors um, that genuinely are there acting across borders in a transnational way but are not connected or, or uh, supported by any of the states. And one of the, one of the positive things about that is that, the, in theory, um, there should be a greater unity of action, uh, basis for unity of action among states. And then I would make also um, a distinction between perhaps transnational and global aspects of the, of the problem. Not only are these, some of these actors transnational, meaning they're crossing borders, like Boko Haram, for example, is now operating in northern Cameroon and Chad. 
but they also have a global aspect in the sense that through you know, virtual connections and so on, they can be connected to a wider agenda that has something to do with the Middle East or the world or a, you know, a global perspective. So I think that's also a useful um, distinction. But um, you know, the, I think the real purchase of a lot of those distinctions uh, for policymakers is when we get down to brass tacks of running programs and what do we want to do, right? Um, yeah, so as far as the, um, the weaponry, I would just um, agree with what my colleague was mentioning. Absolutely, there's room for more uh, state control. Um, that's a question of the power and uh, capability and capacity of the state. I also agree that there are questions of um, you know, unregulated transfer of weapons. I think the Small Arms Survey has done recent um, studies about that, and so we have to look at um, where all those weapons are coming from. Another thing about weapons is that, to my understanding, a lot of those um, weapons can, are very durable, and that's one of the very nice features of them as objects, but is very unfortunate for conflicts, which means they can be moved around and stay on the continent and be used year after year in different conflicts. Ammunition might be another place to look. My impression is that that's a place where um, there's more clear importation and maybe a place to look for more regulation, but I, I don't have more details um, on that. Uh, and then, you know, a couple questions about how we conceptualize the terrorist threat and what its connection is to um, the, uh, these questions of approaching it through education and so on. I mean, yes, basically, is my response to this. Is it, more, is it useful to see terrorist groups as an expression of social discontent and grievance, which is then crystallized into a form of support for a terrorist group? I think that's useful because it encourages a more uh, whole of government, whole of society approach to response. Um, would building inclusive and um, equitable institutions and policies help the problem in the long run? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the institutional approach and the countering violent, extremism, countering violent extremism approach is essential in the long run. I do think counterterrorism has got to be one of the tools uh, in the short run. There are terrorist groups now that are well organized and operating. But reconfiguring our thinking about these is definitely useful in the long run for you know, a final, uh, hopefully, um, chance to overcome the challenge that they're posing. Thank you very much. We will now go on the second round of questions. Um, I have no one from the first row. Oh, good. I have from the second row this gentleman, the man immediately behind him, the gentleman there, and the guy behind him. So please introduce yourself and make your question short. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'm a vis uh, Fulbright Visiting Scholar to the size of Johns Hopkins. Uh, just now, I, I have a question for Dr. <coughs> Nichols. Uh, in the last year's summit, uh, African and U.S. summit, uh, the President Obama uh, put forward the, the security uh, governance initiative. And it, 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 uh, it seems that the United States focus on the uh, help uh, of Africans to, to, to build this uh, self-reliance uh, ability. Uh, does that mean with the uh, full, uh, uh, full unfolded uh, pivot to East Asia, the United States may downgrade its support or its help to United States, uh, to, to Africa? And uh, will this cast uh, some negative uh, implication for the anti-terrorist uh, movement, uh, the, the, the effort in Northeast, uh, in not Northwest Africa? Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is TJ Graney. Uh, I'm from Africa Defense Forum. We're a quarterly journal by uh, US Africa Command. Um, my question is about something both of you touched on and, and Dr. Nichols ended with, which is what happens next, um, and specifically about de-radicalization. Um, a lot of these folks are coming back. Uh, Tunisia has said that, that 3,000 people have left to join ISIS. They will return. Many are radicalized. Um, what works? There, there's kind of the Saudi model that is very energy intensive, that is uh, theological, that involves a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction. And there are other models that are more pragmatic, that deal more with uh, offering job programs, offering money incentives, other things. Uh, Thank you. What can be done? Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Bellamy from CSIS. Um, this is a question that I know Ben Nichols knows a lot more about than I do. Um, uh, I wanted to point to a particular case of an African country that faced an extremely virulent 
extremist insurgency over a, a number of years and managed to crush that extremist insurgency. Uh, and of course, it's the case of Algeria. Uh, now, Algeria's methodology was probably not one that a lot of other African states are necessarily going to want to emulate, certainly not those with democratic values or scruples regarding the rule of law and human rights. But uh, the fact is that, that that was an insurgency that was every bit as brutal as what we're seeing today in Syria and Iraq uh, at the hands of Daesh, and in fact, uh, justified at the time using the same language that we're hearing out of Iraq and Syria today. Uh, so, a la you know, so Mali and, and Nigeria are not going to embrace the Algerian model, but they still need to do a lot. I think we would agree to improve the performance of their security sector. And so, how do you, you know, what what needs to be done to enable them, stopping short of the Algerian model, to be a lot more effective uh, in in terms of their security performance? Thank you very much. Uh, I heard a lot about uh, terrorism being uh, an expression, a violent expression of uh, discontent and issues of governance, which in some way seems to legitimize, albeit uh, inadvertently, terrorism. I was wondering, uh, shouldn't the response of terrorism uh, instead include a convincing message, particularly to the populations which are most uh, vulnerable to its recruitment, a convincing message is that Yes, there may be legitimate grievances, but violence is not a proper way to address them. And uh, any solution obtained through violence will be worse than the original evil. Let's say people who are ready to attack and kill uh, undefended civilians cannot be expected to provide a solution to, to your problems. Shouldn't this be part of the response? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a fifth question, and I see a gentleman at the back. We are in a red tie. Please, you have the floor. Introduce yourself and make your question short. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Mohamed Dini. I am representing the Center for African Peace and Research based in Minnesota. Uh, Thank you, first of all, uh, to Withdraw Wilson African Department. Uh, really, we have been working to help the African youth inside the United States and back home in Africa. The problem that we have seen in Nigeria or in Somalia or some parts in Africa is radicalization. We have been concentrating to explain and tell our youth that this is the way that they have, they can have better future if they go to college or university, if they listen to their scholars, religious scholars, the good one is who tell the reality of the truth of the Islam. Because what we are seeing, uh, some organizations in Somalia or Nigeria, they don't represent the real religion of Islam. In the name of this religion, they have been doing something that's unacceptable to the religion. So we want to target and talk to our youth in and outside the United States and explain them invest in them peace education, that's what we call peace education. Is there any strategy, strategy that you guys you have already have in mind? How can we get the hearts and minds of these beautiful youth who are losing their life is nonsensely? So we can get solution which is to teach them, learn them, tell them that the peace education that can be the solution. Also, one last word, uh, coherent coordination and communication between us as an Africanist and also us as an Americanist. It's the only way that we can achieve and prevail, and I hope that we will 100% prevail. So how can we get um, these young men, their hearts and minds? What's the best solution? What's your plan? Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. We've had very interesting questions. How do you de-radicalize the youth? And the youth in Africa is huge. It's growing very fast and it's going to become, if it's not already, a major social force in, in the years to come. Um, the Algerian model, it worked at a particular time. Can it work now? And was it a 100% success? 
did it secure Algeria in terms of its territory, but had unintended consequences outside of Algeria? Uh, oh, so these are some of the questions. And this time, I want to invite um, Benjamin to, to kick off the responses. So you have the floor. OK, uh, great. A lot of really interesting issues. I'll do my best here to uh, not miss any and try to, try to cover them here. Um, yeah, I think, so uh, our colleague here mentioned uh, the Security Governance Initiative. It's a new initiative from the U.S. government, and my understanding of it, I've had a bit of um, uh, background and, and uh, experience with it, is that it's an effort to partner with um, six pilot uh, cases of African uh, countries in order to support um, really security governance. So it's a, a way of partnering and thinking about how to help countries um, have uh, in some ways more effective and also more legitimate or de more democratic um, processes and institutions. I think that that's a po very positive um, initiative in the sense that it's trying to play again the long game of, of trying to support the um, aspects of responses that will um, pull away some of the grievances, the underlying challenges that are actually fueling uh, some of the terrorist challenges. Do I think that this means um, uh, it suggests something about a pivot to Asia or that this uh, will have some kind of impact on, on that? Um, no, my impression is that the Security Governance Initiative, one interesting thing about it is a lot of that work is not um, extremely expensive work, even if it's extremely um, important work. My impression is that the U.S. government is um, interested and concerned about terrorism in, in Africa. It sees the challenge like its African partners do. And while there are um, large geostrategic um, developments within the U.S. Um, outlook, I don't think that there's any um, lack of attention to terrorism in North and West Africa, particularly Libya, but also um, in some of the other countries, including um, in the Lake Chad Basin. So um, that's kind of my sense on that. Um, as far as the um, uh, de-radicalization approach, I think here is a really maybe a good opportunity to talk about how um, important context is, both at the national and the local level. You know, you had mentioned the Saudi Arabia model. I mean, that's just um, we've done at the Africa Center some programs that have talked about de-radicalization with African partners. It's a model that just doesn't apply for lots of reasons, for resources and, and, and other concerns in a lot of African contexts. I think um, if it's you know de-radicalization and DDR kind of reintegration, that part of it, I think is very contextual. Um, it has a lot to do with what's acceptable for when people have done something that's unacceptable within a society. What are the processes by which they can be redeemed and brought back in? I don't think that there's one model for that, and I don't think it's one that works one way. Um, certainly, in all of the countries that I've been kind of putting together as North and West Africa, which you know are, are as varied as you know, Tunisia and, uh, uh, you know, Nigeria, right? I mean, for this, for the purposes of this talk, I think it's very contextual and specific to communities and to countries. But I think that that's a really useful area of, um, uh, of consideration now. And I would say also that my, um, I know we have some colleague, colleagues here from USAID who have been thinking about that work. And I would also say that Vanita and her colleagues are probably going to be um, able to address some of the questions about educating youth for peace and some of the work that's being done in that space um, currently. Um, I would just mention as an aside on that um, one, you know, the question about the idea that radicalization is really a result of an insufficient or inaccurate religious education um, is an interesting idea and one I've heard before and not only in the African context, but while doing some research about um, the challenges of radicalization in the UK, uh, some of the people that I was meeting with in, in some of the, the cities in, in the UK also said that a real challenge that we have is that you know, young people who identify as Muslim don't know much about the religion itself. And, and that shortcoming in their knowledge is one reason why they're vulnerable. Um, as far as the uh, Algeria model and then the uh, kind of question about terrorism as just a result of um, these underlying conditions, I want to, I guess, state uh, clearly that I'm uh, not intending with anything that I say to justify um, terrorism. I take the point, uh, if we um, don't make a, a clear um, statement about the unacceptability of terrorism and, and violence towards civilians, um, that we risk um, uh, not addressing how wrong it is. Uh, but I do think that it's useful to focus on these underlying um, drivers. And the question of creating a clear message in response is an important one for states to take on. And one that I tried to point out, I think, when I was first speaking, is a real challenge for some African countries. Uh, the idea of having public messages on behalf of the government, having military and state um, uh, security forces being able to convey a message or 
con comfort with the press and so on. Uh, another important um, issue. And I would also say, you know, um, creating a positive narrative is important and it's also troubled in a lot of contexts. The UK went through a, a process of trying to identify a way of describing British values. Um, and it's a troubled process to talk, to create a, a positive narrative. It's not, um, it doesn't always lead to immediate consensus. Um, but it's important to be able to offer a counter narrative or an alternative vision and a set of opportunities to, to young people who are vulnerable. I think the last thing I'll just say about that is that I think it's very useful for African governments not to see populations and young people as suspicious because they might be supporting a terrorist organization, but rather they should clearly identify the terrorist organization as the problem and express extra concern for their citizens who may be subject to pre being prey by that organization. I think that type of approach is a lot more useful and productive in the long run. Then the last thing on the Algerian model, if it's a model. Um, so, you know, Algeria is an interesting case. It's true that they've taken a very hard um, warlike approach toward terrorism, certainly in the 90s. They've also done some interesting things like past um, clemency laws in 2000 and 2005. Um, so they haven't had just one um, approach, uh, although they emphasize, I think, publicly the, 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 the hard-nosed kinetic approach. I mean, some of the results, and I think our moderator mentioned, is that, you know, that those terrorists, that may have worked for some terrorist organizations operating in the southern part of their country for them, but it may have also distributed them into neighboring countries. I think the Algerian position would be they're very happy to work with those countries to strengthen their response to that problem within their borders, too. Uh, that's one way to go about it. But um, I, I'm not sure that Algeria is simply a model of um, repression, but I do think that the question of state capacity or capability to do that is not even available to some of the um, countries that we're talking about. So places like Niger um, or Mali, I think, don't even have the security or defense apparatus um, available to take that um, type of heavy-handed approach in all of their, their space, even if they were, uh, were to want to go that route. Thank yes. you very much. Yes, Idaya. Yes. Um, the Algeria model, or what do we do in terms of de-radicalization? I think first and foremost, any strategy that will actually be adopted must be rooted in the local context, really. What exactly is this country all about and what have been their experiences? For instance, when you look at Nigeria, you see that amnesty or the clemency has actually been tried in the Niger Delta. How effective that was? still remains to be seen. I guess my colleague will be talking about that in the second section of this. But again, what is very, very important to actually point out is that one size fits all will not be good enough for our contest. Because in terms of the recruitment strategy, it varies. So some people voluntarily joined this set. You can deal with them and say, yeah, the Algerian model, you do this, you do that. But some most of the people have, were co-opted, either through blackmail, abduction, or any other means by most of the sets. So what we've actually been talking in terms of is how do we um, find these people, well, separate, isolate, and reintegrate based on what the recruitment strategy is basically all about. Do you deal with people who were abducted Part of the Chibok girls, some say they are already uh, suicide bombers, people that they just go into communities, they get them, or people that they blackmail and say, if you do not join Boko Haram, we are going to kill all members of your family. And amnesty, obviously, is not even good enough in our contest, really, because it's going to incite gr more grievances in the local community. So it calls for a, an holistic approach that is well thought of and rooted in the local context. In terms of the knowledge, what we've actually been doing, particularly with the youth and, um, and people generally, is having counter-radical narrative out there. For instance, there are lots of clerics that have preached against this set. But who knows about it? There are content, there are cassettes, there are video, there are books all over northern Nigeria and the Sahel actually disputing most of the teachings of this group. But how to scale it up is actually the challenge. Of course, again, there are challenges attached to it. Most of the uh, clerics that preached against 
the set. They were the set, first set of people targeted by Boko Haram immediately, even before they started the uprising again in 2010. They tried as much as possible to kill most of these guys, and it's still ongoing. But any, uh, any CVE project will have to place so much emphasis on counter-radical uh, narrative itself. Thank you very much. I, I think we are gradually drawing to a close. But uh, since um, I believe in democracy, I would ask if there's anybody who strongly feels that, uh, that he or she wants to say something that is so important to this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> that if, if you don't say it and you get out of this room, you will wonder why you stayed here. <coughs> Two people. <laughs> There's a gentleman in the no, suit the and a gentleman at the back, but please you keep can it see very short. Sorry, there is a woman at where, the back. Yeah. She raised up her hands. Oh. No, 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 no. No, she raised up her hands. Okay, the, the lady, the session. gentleman in the suit, and the, the the gentleman at the back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Monday Alade. I'm from Nigeria. My question is this. I mean, let me put it in form of a statement. I did my NYC in northern part of Nigeria. And one big problem I discovered was that is that in the northern Nigeria, people are actually suffering. No food. I remember being traveling to Bauchi and I stopped by in a restaurant to eat. As I was eating, I left my food to go get water. Before I came back, some little kids came from nowhere and picked up my food. I came back, I was like, wow, they ate everything. And apparently, these children were hungry. And they are neglected children, you know, that need to be taken care of. Now, how do we address those kind of problems in the northern part of Nigeria? Because without addressing such problem, I doubt if the issue of Boko Haram or radicalization can actually be solved. Because that is where the problem began, I mean, started from. Now, apart from that, most northern government, uh, governors, what are they doing in their own capacity to address this problem? We often talk about the Nigerian state, the Nigerian state, but each of these state government gets allocation. What are they doing with this fund? What okay. are they doing? All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the lady? Please introduce yourself. Gwen Dillard uh, from Voice of America, retired. I want to ask a specific question. We know that Al-Shabaab recruits regularly uh, from American cities. Uh, youth in American cities, principally Minneapolis, also Columbus, to go back and fight with them. As far as you know, does Boko Haram or Akim or Ansardine do the same thing? Are they also recruiting from the United States? <coughs> Thank you very much. And the last, but not the least. Akin Kolawole is my name. Oh, you, I thought you had asked the question earlier. No, that, that's correct. Yeah, please, please. I think you should allow somebody else in the interest of fairness. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's okay, please. I, I know, I know, I know. But you just, the organizers have the, the next session will come, and the organizers have uh, given me very strict instructions. <laughs> I'm sure you would understand. Now, uh, quickly, can you respond to the two questions? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, the first question, really, it's not just about educating the people. There is a need for the reform of the Almagiri education itself. The Almagiri are the kids he was actually referring to. They are most likely um, Quranic students um, in, in most of the mad madrasas in northern Nigeria. But historically, these madrasas were well administered. But in the recent years, there has been a breakdown, not just in the educational system of Nigeria, but that of even madrasa education. So the holistic approach we are also talking about will include that in itself. Then um, the second one, what are the people doing, really? When you look at Bornu, Yobe, and, and uh, Adamawa State, particularly Bornu State, they have not been able to in, embark on capital projects in the recent past because emphasis is actually on fighting the insurgency. Every day, houses are burnt, um, sc uh, schools are burnt, they are rebuilding. 
and doing lots of rehabilitation. But aside from the presidential initiative for the Northeast, the Northeastern governors are also coming together with an initiative. They had one during the last administration, but because of the change in administration, we have been trying to get them to actually adopt the same framework from the last administration and just dust it up, had more initiative to it and work and run with, with it. For Boko Haram, are they recruiting? Boko Haram is really not sexy enough. So we are not seeing people really, we do not have evidence of people coming from America to join Boko Haram because even within Nigeria, we are seeing more people leaving Nigeria to join ISIS than to be involved in Boko Haram. Yes, at the beginning, there were some misguided people really from elite, from elite families involved in Boko Haram. But now what we really suspect is because of this transnationality uh, of crime. When you look at Mali, in Mali, it was not really only the, the Ansa, Ansardine, Mujao, and the locals that were really fighting. We, con we continue to argue that what the people want was a state of Asawad, never an Islamic state of Asawad. But people fighting, they came all the way from Pakistan and everywhere to be involved. Mo in fact, most of the enforcers. So people are doing that, but really there is no, there, there is a tendency, a shift to actually move to places like Yemen, Syria, Iraq, than for people to join Boko Haram from out of Nigeria, yeah. except mercenaries. Yeah, really. thank you. You have just one minute. Okay. Um, so to my knowledge that I can't think of, at least right now, um, examples of um, people coming to Boko Haram, AQIM, or Ansar ad -Din from outside of the region. I think um, AQIM, something in my mind is telling me that uh, they picked up networks from a group called JIA in France and in, in Europe. Um, and they may, they, I'd have to look at it, but there may be a couple examples of recruits from, um, from Europe, but I don't know. Um, and I just want to say a final thing about the Algeria model because it's got me um, thinking. You know, the Algeria model also has um, certain limits. One is, you know, Algeria also suffered the Inamines attack recently. So 20, 25 years after an approach, if you're still having big attacks, you, you can argue whether you've had success or not within your own territory. They also have attacks in the north. It's just not as well reported, but there are attacks still ongoing in, in the northern part. And then the other thing is just to, I mean, bring back my last point, I guess. When I encouraged um, us and policymakers to um, think about the aftermath or plan for the aftermath, I'm not sure that Algeria has done that. Um, and I think that's one of the concerns. I mean, uh, you know, they have questions about um, uh, responses to violence that took place um, in the 90s on both sides of that conflict. They have an approach of uh, turning the page and not mentioning the national tragedy, which I think is actually written into law. Um, and they have a you know, question about what the next generation of leaders is going to be after those who find their legitimacy from the revolution. So I'm not sure that you know, even quite apart from the, their ability to face the, the terrorism threat, I'm not sure that they've moved on and thought about a way to move forward. What comes next? I'm not sure that Algeria right now knows. Now, thank you very much. I, have been, I was asked to <laughs> summarize, but you would all agree with me that this has been a very rich and robust discussion. But I would just say two things. Consider it a takeaway. And that derives from the question that she asked. Unfortunately, can you ask her to introduce herself before, before we leave? No, she's here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you. Oh, sorry. Norma Krieger. From? Thank you very much. I think one of the great challenges we face is how do we prevent violent non-state actors from becoming terrorist groups. And in a sense, embedded in that is the whole concept of what is the difference. Uh, I would say that you have violent non-state actors like rebels, like secessionist movements. You have uh, non-state violent actors like my ethnic minorities that want recognition. Uh, they will not kill ordinary people. They would usually attack government institutions, government forces, but the terrorists kill everybody and also target the state. And we, they are distinguished by the methods and the sheer brutality that they display as a kind of messaging tactic. 
But having said that, I think two things that are very important is what kinds of responses have worked so far? And if they have not worked, how do we redesign and, de and recalibrate our responses to ensure that in the next, in the future, either in the medium to the long term, we get better results? Particularly since both, both our experts tell us that things will have to get worse before they get better. How are we prepared in the aftermath, as Benjamin so eloquently prepared, and how do we put people at the center of the response? I, I thank you for your kind attention and urge you, I will invite you to have coffee for 15 minutes and then urge you to stay with us, come back again. We have another session. Thank you for your attention.